Good morning, U.S. History. How are we? I pressed the record button, button so we are now beginning. Um, you will see me distracted every once in a while, and my gaze will shoot off to the right, and my speech pattern will lower. It's because I'm admitting someone, um, and I'm clicking the right buttons over there. Um, I do really do hope that you and your families are doing well. Um, I hope you're abiding by the shelter in place order and that um, you're encouraged that life can have some normality to it. I do want to um, remind you that we've gotten another um, update from Cambridge. If anyone is in contact with Aubrey, please let her know that I'm trying to admit her. Uh, but it is. I don't know. I don't know if there's a slow internet connection or something. Um, it's not allowing me to admit her. Uh, and then it just kicked her off there for some reason. Um, anyway, uh, we have gotten a, a, an additional update from Cambridge. It's much like what, you know, what we thought that we would have to have files uh, on each student and, you know, make sure that work reflects, um, the assumed grade and then they would evaluate that based on other factors um, and the work that we present, et cetera. So at this point, we're still in class. We're still live. We still have to um, cover the curriculum. So um, that is, um, that's happening. I mean, that's our spring. Um, when we, when we left class on Monday, I believe that I had given you your next major B-level essay. But I had said it won't have a due date yet because there's one big gaping hole in our study of the Gilded Age and the progressive era, politics, society, et cetera, um, from 18, late 1870s all the way up through the 1920s. And as we discovered on Monday, that is, um, the plight of African Americans during that era of time. Um, this will be our last section of notes um, that are, you know, official notes that you write out and that you will be responsible for in your portfolio. Um, I'll remind you that hopefully I'll be moving too rapidly through these for you to be able to actually. Um, write down the notes so make sure and just write down topics and or take screenshots kind of thing um let's just dive right in shall we if i can find it and there we go all right so and we're there <clears throat> you can see the date here. We won't be going through 1968. Um, welcome to class, Ava. It's good to, to see your icon. Um, you should be looking at a screen that says Civil Rights, 1895 to 1968. There are some really, really, really painful images that we'll be looking at. Um, be aware of that. Um, it is not a, a, a pleasant history. Uh, African Americans, most specifically, you know, in the Southern region, we all know. Um, and contrary to what the rest of the world thinks about uh, Mississippi's educational system or Mississippi students or, or our population, um, in all reality, we are educated uh, on, on generic and general civil rights issues and ideas and personalities from a very young age. It's one of our primary strands uh, in elementary school and social studies in elementary school in the curriculum. So a lot of times you would have probably done projects or, or poster boards, so to speak, in third, fourth, fifth grade on um, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, et cetera, the major figures of the civil rights movement. Um, so you've been exposed to some of this information before. That's not necessarily the purpose of the notes that we're covering here. It's not to give you a general um, idea um, of, of the civil rights era, which we say is the 1950s and 1960s. 
I honestly think that the civil rights era is, is a misnomer. It shouldn't be used. It's not really, um, it wasn't an era. Civil rights has been a long, hard struggle um, for decade upon decade upon decade. Um, it, it was a civil rights war. It was a war for my internet stability was off there so hopefully you heard that but it was um a war for access to equal rights um and we're going to look at some of the earlier struggles okay that fit into the time period in which we're we're discussing um but where do we begin that's the question right uh where do we start if you're talking about civil rights we we're not doing the 1950s and 1960s so how far back do we go um, if we if we begin in the 1950s, then we leave off the struggle of the 1940s um, and the struggle for equality and inclusion in the armed forces, et cetera, uh, for equal representation of officers. If we go back to the 1930s and we're, we're in the Depression and oftentimes local administrators of New Deal programs did not make, uh, even though there was no national discriminatory uh, policy specifically codified and aimed at African Americans, local administrations, administrators would often discriminate against African Americans. Um, plus, sharecroppers in the South were, were hit extremely hard in the Depression. Um, so, do we go back to there? Do we go back to the 1920s when there were riots in America um, and, and African American literature and art was finding its voice in music, et cetera? Harlem Renaissance, do we go back to the 19-teens with World War I? You get the picture here, yeah, probably, right? Um, we can keep going back. Um, where's the logical starting point? That's the question in the civil rights movement uh, because it seems as though to leave off something erodes some of the foundational understanding uh, that should be applied to this particular topic. <clears throat> we are, um, we have a starting point, but I want you to see that there was a civil rights struggle going all the way back to um, pre-Civil War days. This is from a famous speech made by Frederick Douglass uh, in 1852. Um, this is the transcript of his speech, re-recorded in the late uh, 19th century. And this was a man who was, okay, the media is not found. Of course it's not. The embedded video is not working. Um, but basically, he calls out um, very, some very important dignitaries and statesmen who he had been invited to speak on, the July, on, on July the 4th in front of uh, some, some politicians um, at this big 4th of, Ju uh, 4th of July rally on what 4th of July meant to... to, to um, a black America who was free and he just absolutely went off. I mean, he intellectually and, and logically ripped apart um, American um, society and its, and its dependence upon slavery, et cetera. And so that's, that's in the 1850s. Um, of course, you can go back to the 1840s and see uh, certain slave uprisings and, and slaves attempting to run away. The, the struggle for civil rights has been a long, hard struggle uh, in America. <clears throat> some famous images that you're probably aware of um, that you I'm sure remember from uh, elementary school uh, having covered a lot of these um, uh, sharecroppers uh, in the south the Civil War um, famous um, black soldiers of, of the Civil War Frederick Douglass Abraham Lincoln with you know obviously the Emancipation Proclamation but remember the, America freed the slaves through the 13th Amendment. Don't forget that. Um, the, the horrible effects, as you can see here, of, of some of the impacts on slavery. Um, but then when slavery is over, um, there's not instant equality. Um, we're not going to go into this extensive background on race relations during the Civil War or prior to the Civil War. We know the structure that existed there, the patriarchal um, structure that existed throughout the South, the plantations, how they were set up, the cruelty that existed. We, we, we know these um, in theory because we have been exposed to them um, 
Hang on just a moment, guys. Let me deal with. Okay, got that done. We know them in theory because we've dealt with them in elementary school and throughout your educational career. Um, so we're going to begin after that. Um, to remind you of, of reconstruction, not students' most favorite thing uh, to study, and I'm sure in seventh and eighth grade when you studied it, it was, it was potentially a miserable experience. Um, Reconstruction is often seen as, as a failure in a lot of aspects. There's a famous um, quote from a historian that, that um, actually was from a politician, my apologies, who said that, um, you know, the South lost the Civil War, but won Reconstruction. And Reconstruction was supposed to rebuild, restore the South. It didn't either. Um, it was supposed to protect African Americans, and it, it somewhat succeeded. Some of it's more um, successful elements include the building of schools for freedmen, for those African Americans who had been freed, um, uh, schools and, and uh, in, incorporating uh, uh, voting rights for African Americans into Southern society. Uh, of course, we know that during Reconstruction, the military had to take over to institute a lot of these policies. Um, now, as you can see, the South was quite destroyed, right? Um, so it makes sense to begin civil rights like right after um, Reconstruction. Does anyone remember, um, so that's why this slide's title is Post-Reconstruction Race Relations, all right? Does anyone remember what officially ended, um, what officially ended Reconstruction? We've actually covered this one in class. Hopefully somebody can remember. The election of Rutherford B. Hayes. You are not incorrect, are you? That's an odd way of saying that because why? Remember there are a number of ways to say that, Rutherford B. Hayes being elected, the compromise of, of 1877, the election of 1876, the removal of troops from the South, all the same thing, right? All bundled up together um, in, in the same happening. Now, immediately, I'll remind you that immediately upon the um, freeing of the slaves, there was not instantaneous freedom. Uh, you're not wrong, George, that's correct. Um, there was an instantaneous equality and freedom. Okay, so uh, a student has just notified me that I keep cutting out every three minutes. Is anyone else experiencing this? I'm putting the lecture on pause. Ah. That is unfortunate. Uh, I tell you what, um, if you would hold on just a moment, let me pause the recording. All right. Um, Hang on just a moment. Hey, I think my streaming needs to be She's, I'm listening to music. It's now a different sheet. Yeah, my like, well, internet's cutting in and out. You don't get good video service back in your room. Well, I have. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still. All right, so I'm back. Um, yeah, I don't know what's happening. Um, I don't know what's up with the internet. Um, hopefully we can work through it. Maybe the recording will be crystal clear and you can watch the, um, thank you. Um, you can watch the video on YouTube later today. Um, a reminder, <coughs> Immediately upon the uh, end of the Civil War, immediately when soldiers went home, uh, when Confederate so soldiers were Confederate no more, and everybody went back home to the plantation, there was this assumption among white Southerners uh, 
that everything was just kind of kind of returned to normal. Um, and if you recall from your studies, um, African American studies in elementary school and junior high, um, you probably remember um, the the slave laws, the slave codes that existed in the South. Basically, states just essentially took that section of laws and then restated them as the, quote, black codes, unquote. And so um, the federal government eventually had to step in to ensure access to uh, equal rights in the South. But for a very short period of time after the Civil War, things went back to the way they were, uh, as, as almost as though the 13th Amendment hadn't happened. Um, and of course, this is the time period uh, where there's a battle between Johnson and the White House and Congress over what plan will be instituted uh, for Reconstruction. Eventually, they, they settle upon a congressional reconstruction, a redistricting of the South, where military are literally stationed in the South and can protect African-American voting rights, right to um, free movement, right to um, commerce, et cetera. So let's look at some of these, shall we? Okay, that's the setup. Um, here's some famous images from post-Reconstruction race relations that you may be familiar with already. You can see down in the bottom, NAACP office window. Um, origin of the Lynch Law, where they say it's, it's um, attributed to um, Judge Lynch. In the top left, you see a famous, ish, uh, a famous image. Uh, you can see my icon floating across it, hopefully. You can see a famous image of Plessy, um, Homer Plessy, who refused to um, sit in the um, um, black uh, Card that we're going to get into this uh, later that led to the famous Supreme Court decision that created separate but equal. That's actually not an image of that, even though it's portrayed as, as such. This is a much, much, much earlier image uh, from Philadelphia, uh, and it was uh, it was a local case, so it's not even Homer Plessy. But for some reason, history shows that as being that. Uh, moving forward. to leave the theater for this performance. Okay, now if you were sitting in my classroom, you would have seen this assignment, right? Um, I, I, I argued with myself, which is a sight to see, by the way, uh, on whether or not to give you this assignment. Um, and the de disregard the date. Um, and I'm going to skip it, all right? Rather than a mini documentary on the creation of the NAACP, I am going to um, give you a basic A-level Cambridge question in association with this, okay? Uh, remember, A-level question is cause-based. So rather than give you this particular full um, assignment, I, and I will, I will put this on um, Canvas after our class today, and the A-level question, uh, the next journal right, which will be due um, even before the B-level question when it's due over the progressive era, is why by um, the early 20th century had the NAACP form, all right? So what led to the formation of the NAACP? That's all the question is. Um, so we're skipping this particular assignment and moving on with the essay. <laughs> now, if I had your textbook in front of you, the, the thick textbook, I would, at this point, have you get it out and I'd have you do a search. And I would, I would have you try to find the places where um, the terms um, Black Americans, African Americans, um, Black history together, uh, are found with any long description at all. Where uh, are uh, African Americans in traditional historical textbooks included? Would anyone like to make a guess of what eras of American history one can find significant amounts of information about African Americans? <laughs> 
<clears throat> the 1960s, absolutely. Um, matter of fact, most most um, history books, textbooks at the high school level, we'll, we'll have an entire chapter on that. Civil War, absolutely, Jay. Um, always some inclusion uh, in, in Civil War. And you could extend that to slavery as an institution, right? There's always um, some information about that. Where else? How about Reconstruction? Freedmen's Bureau. Does anybody remember that from junior high? Um, perhaps some with the 1920s and the advent of jazz and the Harlem Renaissance. But other than that, traditionally, that's that's a limit of it. Um, now, that has changed. That is significantly changing, as a matter of fact, in the past 15 to 20 years. And textbooks are beginning to include um, African-American history. Um, well, welcome to class. Good to see your little icon here. Um, yeah. <laughs> As of recent, uh, in the past couple of decades, more and more and more inclusion uh, a variety of groups. But as far as any in-depth coverage of African-American history, that's kind of where it's limited to. Meaning, it is as though in our history books that anything of significance within the African-American communi uh, community stopped uh, at Plessy versus Ferguson, at separate but equal. And then nothing significant happened except for maybe the 1920s, you know, with jazz and Harlem Renaissance, et cetera, maybe great migration until the 1950s and 60s, which means there's about 90 years of silence here. Um, it's as though suddenly the civil rights movement just arose in the 19, bloomed in the 1950s and 60s out of the long dead ashes of, of the South's um, Civil War era history. Well, that's not true. In reality, um, if you go back to the Re Reconstruction, African Americans emerged from Reconstruction with some rather significant protections. If you look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, the fact that during Reconstruction, military had um, been stationed in the South protecting African American rights to, to vote and to, to serve in office. Mississippi's only black senator happened during this era of time, right? Um, state legislatures across the South had African Americans serving in them. There were in the South, black Americans living and working side by side with ex-Confederates. Now that's not exactly the history we've learned because we pick up around the time of Jim Crow. Now, was it a utopia? Well, God, no. Were there acts of violence? Absolutely. Were there lynchings in the South? Well, of course there were. I'm not trying to discount the violence and terror that um, Black Southerners faced during this era of time. I'm simply saying that um, I don't think that history recognizes widely enough um, the gains that were made by African Americans during the 20 years, 30 years following the Civil War. See, it's not as though Plessy versus Ferguson, which I keep referring to, but we're not there yet, um, was a continuation or um, some type of codified way of validating what was happening. It was actually a reversal of rights for African Americans. It took away rights that had been earned, all right? Um, and that's, that's what makes it such a dramatic and traumatic event in U.S. history. Uh, now, <clears throat> there had been white reformers that had moved into the South and worked in freedmen's schools, et cetera, worked for the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, and even their posture towards African-Americans was rather patriarchal. Um, and in the South, even, there were white redeemers um, who were, for lack of a better term, tolerating a lingering black voice in politics. Um, through the 1880s, politics remained relatively open 
and somewhat de democratic. There were pockets in the South where African Americans couldn't vote. Um, they were already beginning to segregate, segregate um, locally. But for the most part in the 1880s, politics remained open. If you look, 64% of eligible uh, voters were participating in elections in, in the 1880s. That's including black Southerners. And African Americans remained in elective office. There were African Americans in Af um, elective office in South Carolina to 1900, Georgia to 1908. And um, states within the former Confederate states sent black legislators to Washington in every single election cycle, um, but one, all the way up through 1900. Now, was there disenfranchisement? Was there removal of the right to vote? Was there violence and discrimination? Of course there were, um, but it remained inconsistent and, and it was largely a local issue. Now see, that will change in the 1890s. So during the 1880s in the South, African-Americans continued to vote. They served on juries pursued education, um, owned businesses. There were a lot of former Confederates who were accepting the outcome of the Civil War. Now, it's not as though the animosity had disappeared from those who had served in the Confederacy, but rather their anger and resentment oftentimes were aimed at um, Northerners, at um, specifically Northern Jewish populations, um, Washington, D.C., et cetera, not necessarily at African Americans. Now, with their children, one generation later, that would completely change, okay? Um, and a lot of that anger and resentment and, and built up negative feelings that had existed in that first post generation Civil War um, generation in, in the South, in the white generation in the South, would be transferred to their children and manifest itself as intense racism uh, and violence later. Now, um, again, we're studying a very sensitive topic and there will be sensitive issues, there will be sensitive language, um, there will be sensitive images, so be aware of that. But this is a white legislature uh, in Virginia in 1885, um, former Confederate, and you can read the quote here. Nobody objects to sitting in political conventions with, uh, and then you can go on down, no lawyer objects to practicing law with, no, in both branches of, of the Virginia legislature, um, Negro sit as they have a right to sit. So that's odd. That's a really weird historical contradiction. Um, that changed so dramatically um, by the time we get to the turn of the century. All those gains that had been earned, um, the political voice, the economic uh, status, the um, um, availability of quality education or any education in some cases, had, had completely shifted by the time we get to 1900. Now, I'm going to pause right here, all right? Has anyone ever heard this part of history, that for a brief 30-year time period, it's not as though things were perfect, it's not as though utopia was happening, okay? But there were gains being made and it appeared for a very brief moment that African Americans were earning um, their spot on that stage or were being given or what, I don't know the right facilitating term, but were, um, were present on the stage uh, of humanity in the South and in the US, economically, politically, et cetera, that it appeared that that was happening. Um, very similar to the journey um, politically and economically that the Irish had taken, et cetera, even though, you know, we're, we're not, not discounting in any capacity the, the history of slavery. Um, it appeared as though, finally, African Americans, after two centuries, two and a half centuries of oppression, were, were taking their rightful place along other American citizens. But things begin to change in the 1870s and, and 1880s. Um, there were a number of restraints that were being systematically placed on African Americans uh, in the South. And we, you're already aware of some of these economic restraints in the form of sharecropping and tenant farming, political restraints in the form of 
uh, landmark legal casings and the use of gerrymandering, et cetera. And of course, social restraints in the form of, of the horrendous practice of lynching and then the social practice of segregation. So where's our time at? We are 14 minutes till. That's a lot of notes for one day. Okay. Um, Darsham, I'm going to highlight your mic. Or not. I'm trying to. Darsham, unmute. There we go. Um, let me make sure that I... <clears throat> fully understand what is my responsibility to to you the students so that you can speak for the students here momentarily yes sir uh after class i of course have to save the video get it uploaded to youtube um i need to add to canvas the a level question uh, of what led to the forming of the naacp as a replacement assignment for the documentary I have not given you a due date yet for the big B level question of the progressive era. And I need to add a meeting on Friday to uh, address any questions that may exist on, on any of the essays or past grades, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now a couple of you have, uh, thank you for, you can, you can mute your mic again. A couple of you have emailed me on assignments that you've turned in. Uh, I need to remind you, this is a completely different situation. This will be the third time that I've said this, but I want to reiterate it to you. I understand that there's a certain level of injustice in the fact that you're not going to be able to groom your grade that you, in a way that you might have been able to uh, in the fourth nine weeks. So if you have a C or below um, in the class, I, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. So if you have zeros from the third, um, grading quarter uh, from the third nine weeks, then email me when you complete those assignments so that I can get some partial credit into the system and get that posted so that your grade can begin to, to rise somewhat. If you have replaced all your zeros from the third nine weeks and you're still uh, suboptimal grade for your GPA, if you're still C or below, let me know and um, I'll open up, you know, you can go back and take off some of the zeros from a prior semester. Um, I think that's where we stand currently. I think I've got everything covered. Are there any questions before we dismiss? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to say my little bye to you. Um, and then if you have further questions you just don't want to ask in front of other people, hang on and I'll stay on the video after I've stopped recording for you to be able to ask that question. Okay, guys? So if you have no questions, I want you to have a wonderful day. Stay safe. You hear me? I love you and I'm praying for you. And I hope you and your families are doing well. Get your essays written. And we'll see those of you that have questions on Friday and we'll see the mass of you on Monday. Um, now you can hang around if you have questions for everyone else. Have a great day.